So my name's Duncan Agnew, and I'm affiliated with, this is a mouthful, the Institute of Geophysics and Planetary Physics at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography at the University of California, San Diego. Well, I got started, if geodesy includes strain meters, I got started in geodesy in 1978, since for my PhD thesis, I analyzed long base laser strain meter data to understand the tidal deformation of the Earth. Um, fairly soon after that, in 1981, um, we were looking for funding from um, Na the new NASA Space Geodesy Program, and I was funded through them. Um, and so that involved, they made the measurements, we did the interpretation. Um, and it was at a NASA meeting in Maryland that I learned that a group of people from Caltech and UCLA were planning to do uh, measurements with something called GPS, which I'd heard of. Um, in California, I was interested in understanding the deformation offshore of San Diego. And so we joined together, um, uh, to some extent a shotgun marriage by NSF. Uh, but I collaborated with Brad Hager, then at Caltech, to make GPS measurements offshore. And we started doing that in December of 1986 with equipment from UNAVCO and a bunch of other people. Those were the days when the receivers had to be cadged from basically all over the country just to have enough to do anything. Um, I probably don't call myself a geodesist because I've wandered back and forth in the realm between studying crustal deformation and seismology. And if I say geodesist, normally no one knows what that is. So I normally say seismologist or geophysicist. Um, but I could consider myself a geodesist in the sense that the, the area of geodesy is, has been interesting to me actually long, since long before I started doing it professionally. Well, this is kind of the same answer. Uh, if the geodetic techniques means strain meters, that would be in 1978. Um, if it means um, space geodesy, satellite laser ranging, VLBI, I was using data from that in the early 1980s. But the first time I went out and collected my own data with GPS, again, would have been December 1986. Um, that was an interesting time to be doing GPS because, among other things, the um, satellite configuration was such that in December, the best um, constellation was in the middle of the night. So initial GPS measurements consisted of staying up most of the night, and it was always really cold. And I've kept doing field work in GPS for a while. Um, now that area in California has largely been taken over by continuous networks. I've been involved in those. Um, with my colleague Frank Wyatt, I am, I will say, I am to blame or I am responsible for the drilled braced monument design that is, has been widely used. Um, I'm still working with strain meter data and trying to understand what it's telling us about the Earth. I used TI-4100s. Um, they were heavy. The batteries for them were heavier still. They had one, it, the virtue of the fact that they needed a lot of batteries was they needed a lot of power. And there was this spot on the side of the receiver where the 100 watts was being dissipated. And if you were sitting in, a state, in a, the back of a truck on a cold night, you could warm your hands that way. Uh, so that, that was useful. Other than that, there was a lot of fiddling with cassette tapes, loading the program into, into the system with, from a cassette tape, and then putting an, another tape on, hoping that it would all work. Yes, the, the research result from that, um, actually, uh, the first result to come out, we deliberately reoccupied some points that had been measured I found out by accident had been measured in 1973 by a private company under 
under uh, as a with, with grants, I think from the Geological Survey, um, they'd measured a number of lines between the Santa Barbara Channel Islands and the coast, and so we went to some lengths to reoccupy the same points they had done and um, compare those data with the GPS data and get some indication of how things were moving. Things were moving the way plate tectonics always moves. It's, it's millimeters per year. Um, then it was trying to elucidate the pattern of deformation in California. We knew about the faults. There were measurements, thanks to the geological survey, there were measurements right on the San Andreas and San Jacinto fault zone, but there were these unknown areas such as offshore. Um, that's been a constant theme. I spent a good deal of effort um, over the last more than 10 years uh, assembling all the data that was collected by all the different groups in Southern California and with people from MIT and UCLA reprocessing it to come up with a velocity field for Southern California. So that's helping to determine the spatial distribution of motion which feeds into the earthquake rate of earthquakes which feeds into the earthquake hazard problem. With the laser strain meters it's a matter of looking for unusual time variations that may indicate some kind of earthquake related or aseismic motion. The outstanding advance, the, the major advance in geodesy The surprising advance from geodesy was the slow slip event, uh, which turned out to be slow slip and tremor. Um, I think that's the thing that has been a surprise. We didn't have a, we knew already what steady rates of motion were between the plates. Um, we didn't know a lot of details, and, but as far as we knew, things were pretty steady. And so what what making a lot of GPS measurements has enabled us to do is, is start to look at the unsteady part. My explanation would be that slow slip means that we know that the plates are moving at a very steady, very slow rate. Slow slip is that on fault zones we see times when there seems to be faster slip and then slower slip. We call it a slow slip event because it's slow relative to earthquakes. So if it was a slip that occurred over a few seconds, it would radiate seismic waves and we'd call it an earthquake. Since it occurs over periods of hours to days, we call it slow slip because it, it's only detectable geodetically. We can't see it with seismograms. The main technical advance from UNAVCO, I think, has been basically that it has been able to keep the academic community at the cutting edge of GPS technology. Um, it's provided us with a place where somebody tests new GPS receivers, evaluates what they are, makes them available. Um, it's not my field, but I suppose I would also say the, a major technical advance that I've, I've sort of watched from the sidelines is the ability to actually make GPS measurements in really difficult environments such as Antarctica. How geodesy has changed, this is very easy. It's cheaper, and that's very important. Again, thinking back to the early days of space geodesy, Mobile meant three tractor trailer trucks full of equipment. That was mobile VLBI. So it was, as someone once said, it's mobile in the sense that the Earth goes around the sun. And um, GPS complete, and so Space Geodesy was basically done by a few government agencies. It wasn't something any academic could do. We could work with the data. And GPS suddenly made this possible, where the equipment to make these kinds of precise measurements went from being three tractor trailers to a rather bulky TI-4100 to soon after that a couple of suitcases. And 
you could buy them for much smaller amounts of money, and that simply made geodesy widespread. Before that, geodesy was a very small part of geophysics done only by a very few people. And so the, the decrease in cost has made it really a subject that geophysics, a lot of geophysicists participate in. Um, it's been interesting over the years watching UNAVCO itself grow up. Uh, it went through a number of phases of what organization it was housed in, how it was run. I think it took, it's taken a while for the academic community to, to assimilate how to work with an organization, how to maintain an organization like this and have it serve us efficiently. I think we now are in a very good position, but I have to say it did take a little while to get there.